And it's not easy to, to look at the primary results and say, you know, there's a blue wave coming or that clearly it's a repudiation of Republicans. That didn't happen. In fact, in some cases, Republicans are faring well, if not much better than they expected. Hi, I'm Scott Leadingham. Thanks for joining us here in the unique Northwest. With us today to talk about some of the dynamics of the recent Washington primary is Olympia correspondent Austin Jenkins. Thanks for joining us today, Austin. You're welcome, Scott. So Austin, let's break it down a little bit. The recent primary election hitted Governor Jay Inslee running against a lot of people. Let's talk about that and some of the other races that you had your eye on. Break it down for us. Yeah, it was a record of 35, 36 candidates for governor, many of them identifying as Republicans. The most high profile name on that list was Tim Iman, but it was in the end, a Lauren Culp, police chief in tiny Republic Washington that emerged as the number two candidate, about 17% of the vote to Inslee's 15% of the vote. So a very high hill to climb for Culp to win this race and defeat Inslee in a democratic state in a year when we expect there to be a backlash in this state over President Trump. But you know, you never want to count anybody out. You never want to call a race before an election. And uh, the reality is there's a lot of kind of interesting dynamics that are revealed by this primary. And it's not easy to, to look at the primary results and say, you know, there's a blue wave coming or that clearly it's a repudiation of Republicans. That didn't happen. In fact, in some cases, Republicans are faring well, if not much better than they expected. Um, a couple of other statewide races to watch, Scott. We've got two Democrats emerging as the top two contenders for the open lieutenant governor's seat. That would be uh, Denny Heck, the retiring congressman from the 10th District here in Olympia, as well as State Senator Marco Leas, who's the Senate Democrats war leader. A couple of Republican statewide office holders, Kim Wyman, the Secretary of State, seeking a third term. She's at about 50% and is very well known statewide in terms of name recognition. She's up against Gail Tarleton, a state representative. It looks like Kim Wyman is positioned to win re-election, but if there was a, a, a if a blue wave did materialize, she might have trouble hanging on. The Republican who seems to be in trouble is the state treasurer, Dwayne Davidson. He's a one-term treasurer, not well known statewide. And his Democratic challenger, Mike Pellicciotti, who's a Democratic state rep, is actually leading him in that race. And then just one more race I'll mention, Scott, to keep an eye on the state school superintendent race. That's a nonpartisan position, but you've got Chris Rakedahl, the incumbent who was a Democratic lawmaker, who seems to be facing a fairly formidable challenge for Maya Espinosa, who has previously run as a Republican unsuccessfully for the state legislature. She's making a real run for that position. He's down in the 40s, which is not great for an incumbent. And uh, so that's one to watch. So before we focus too much on the next state government that will come into office in January or the next potential governor, let's talk about the current legislature and the current governor. Governor Jansley has resisted so far calling a special session of the legislature, unlike his counterparts in neighboring Oregon and Idaho, which have had special sessions. In fact, Oregon has had two special sessions just in the last several months to deal with various budget issues. What are some of the dynamics there? Why hasn't he? I know he's been called to by at least some of the Republicans in the legislature. Does that suggest that the Washington state budget is just fine and doesn't need any shoring up because of the pandemic? I wouldn't say so. Um, the governor, though, thinks that we can make it till January when the legislature is scheduled to convene its regular session to address the budget. As you know, Republicans uh, disagree with that calculation. The state is now projected to face a cash deficit position, and some are saying that that should trigger automatic across the board cuts. The governor's office doesn't see it that way, and what they're pointing to is the fact the state still has money in reserves. Look, it's an election year. If they are in session, you can't raise money for your campaigns. While we're hearing Republicans saying that there should be a special session, it's not loud, vociferous, constant. So I'm not sure what level of enthusiasm there is across the board for a special session at this point. But again, for the time being, the governor's position is they can wait till January. He's the one that would call them back unless there was a two-thirds majority of lawmakers that wanted to call themselves back into session. That seems unlikely at this point. The argument against waiting is that if you wait, you may have to make deeper cuts. They may be more painful decisions. Sometimes it's earlier to cut sooner. The flip side of that is Maybe by January, there's more federal aid flowing to the, to 
the state. Maybe the legislature will have more information about what the future holds. And with that additional information, we'll be able to make better decisions. That seems to be the tension and the, the pro and con that you often hear. It. You recently reported uh, with the Seattle Times about this topic of no bid contracts and how the state of Washington sort of responded, at least in the earlier days of the pandemic, about how to, you know, get information, display information, these sorts of things. Tell us a little bit about some of these no-bid contracts that went, uh, pretty high-priced ones, I might say, that went to consulting firms. Who got them? How much money was involved? And why was there no bidding process? Well, what happened when um, the coronavirus pandemic hit our state is that the requirement to competitively bid contracts was temporarily suspended for contracts related directly to the COVID crisis. You can understand why that decision would be made, that the, the government needed to work nimbly trying to, for instance, secure testing supplies and personal protective equipment. In many cases, a lot of what the state was doing is buying food uh, to store and or to distribute out to food banks. But it also turns out that McKinsey & Company, which is a very large global consulting firm, was able to secure three no-bid contracts from three different state agencies. The governor's office, through the Office of Financial Management, which is the budget office, assigned a six-figure-a-week contract with McKinsey & Company to provide a governor's decision tool. Essentially, this is data and a team of analysts and consultants to work with the governor office on trying to bring together information on the COVID health effects, economic effects, and also the impacts on people primarily receiving social services in the state. And what the governor's office says is that they needed that data to make good decisions and they could justify the cost. The money that would cover this contract is from the CARES Act. So that lasted for eight weeks and the governor's office didn't re-up and the governor's office couldn't point to a specific decision that was enabled or made possible by that data, but said it helped inform decisions. There are two other contracts. One, with the state's healthcare authority, which oversees the Medicaid program. It was sort of a case study to trace if somebody tested positive for COVID-19, if they were on the Medicaid rolls to make that connection and then try to offer those people additional services. This was part of a larger project the healthcare authority is working on. And then interestingly, McKinsey was brought in on another no-bid contract uh, to work with employment security after the massive unemployment insurance fraud happened. But again, all three of these contracts were no-bid contracts. Um, in the case of ESD, Employment Security, it's been extended a couple of times. These are six-figure-a-week contracts worth uh, several million dollars, all told. And McKinsey's a controversial company. Um, it's been in the press a lot uh, and um, has also recently uh, lost a general contract with the federal government um, after there was an IG investigate, uh, Inspector General report alleging that they were overcharging, that their that their prices were too rich. Um, so that's that's the story of the contracts. We reported this for the Seattle Times, and I'll just note that McKinsey and Company stands behind the work it's done uh, for the state and says it was actually charging a discounted rate to the governor's office at $165,000 a week. Six figures a week, uh, and that sounds pretty hefty, but you know, we're used to making that in public media. That sounds about like what our contracts are like. Uh, Austin, we should pay you a lot more for coming on here all the time and, and spreading this good information and sharing your reporting with us. Thanks for joining us today, Austin. You're welcome, and thanks for having me. You can see more Northwest news, coronavirus updates, and resources at our website, nwpb.org. Thank you for joining us here in the unique Northwest.